poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is Justin Saliba. Justin just took down the $5,300 High Roller WSOP online event for a tidy little 253k as well as a gold bracelet. Justin first came onto my radar less than a year ago as my poker coaching liaison, and I'd love to tell you that I knew about his immense poker talent straight away, but that couldn't be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, we barely even discussed poker because for some silly reason, I just assumed he was some dude who scheduled and planned stuff for me. <laughs> Pretty hilariously, multiple times I've called him out of the blue when I've had any kind of tech issue for a live poker coaching webinar or play and explain, and I like to imagine he was sitting there in the zone playing a full slate of high stakes MTTs only to be interrupted by yours truly because I couldn't figure out whether my audio is working on my own. Good times. The truth of the matter is that despite only pursuing poker in earnest for a couple of years, Justin is a rising star in the poker world. Mark my words, his recent WSOP victory is going to be the first of many. So in today's show with Justin Saliba, you're going to learn how Justin's original life pursuit ended up creating a vacuum only poker has been able to fill, why so many people who work closely with Jonathan Little genuinely love the man, the hilarious story behind the biggest event Justin has ever played in his poker career thus far, an enormous $50,000 buy-in high roller in Florida, and much, much more. Before you dive in, today's episode with Justin Saliba is sponsored by me, Coach Brad Wilson. In 2020, I was teetering on the verge of pulling the plug on the CPG project. I worked 60-hour weeks and averaged about $6 an hour. Before throwing in the towel, I decided to grip my teeth, face my largest inner fear, and throw every ounce of my being into creating the best poker courses I possibly could. If they were awful and everybody made fun of them and hated them, so be it, at least I can say I went down swinging. As it turns out, creating those courses upgraded my own poker game immensely, were so beloved by my villagers I now have a list of 50 or so customers who instantly buy anything I offer, and they are the reason why the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast is still going strong. So what makes my courses so different from everything else on the market? I sell plug-and-play winning poker strategies in very specific spots, that anyone of any skill level can memorize and use. So if you'd like to support what I do at CPG while also massively upgrading your poker game in specific spots, visit ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash courses. The spots covered at ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash courses thus far are preflop strategy, sea betting versus fish on the flop, turn, and river in single raise pots, and obliterating the poor souls who dare to donk bet into you on the flop, turn, or river. More spots are coming very soon, and the offerings will always be updated at ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash courses. And now, without any further ado, I bring to you Poker Coaching's own future star of poker, Justin Saliba. Justin. Welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness Podcast, sir. How you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, man. How are you? I'm doing perfect. It's great having you on. And like we were talking about in the pre-conversation, you know, you were my connection to poker coaching for the longest time. And I was telling you how sh shame shamefully ignorant I am of like the multi-table tournament world scene uh, and then I got told by one of my private coaching students that you took down a 5k, won yourself a bracelet. And I was like, oh shit, Justin's, Justin's more than just my connection at, at poker coaching <laughs> helps me with like all the tech setup and stuff. So congrats, man. Well done. Thanks so much. Thanks to you. Appreciate um, it. I know that like you're newish into the MTT scene, which probably makes a lot more sense too, as to why, like you haven't shown up on my radar because cash game guys, they just, they fly under the radar. And it's, I think for a lot of cash game players, it's purposeful. I think that they 
don't always want the spotlight. They just want to kind of do their own thing, grind, and then get away from everything. For your poker journey, typically we start this show out by asking you, what does that look like? Like, what did your journey through cards, like, where did it begin? Where did it start? And how did it lead you to here? Thanks, man. So whew, the very beginning was probably like when I was maybe 11 or 12. I, I had an older brother who loved poker at the time. And like all the neighborhood kids loved it. And like when you're that age, you just like want to be doing anything that like the older kids are doing. So what year was that, by the way, for the timeline? Oh, man. So I was born in 94. So it was probably like 2005, 2006. Cool. Well, yeah. I, we never hash on one. I think hash them won in like the main event one of the years because I just distinctly remember like being with all those guys. And I think it was the year after Raymer when hash yeah. won. That was the year when like the mouth made the final table and busted by Steve Daneman. Like I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I remember yeah. like listening to that on live stream or something like in my house. That was the old, <laughs> the old party poker days. But yeah, that's a, that's a good time to enter the world of poker. I mean, besides the fact that you were 11. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I just like, we would just play every week and just watch, you know, anything of poker on TV. The TV show Tilt was on, you know, I probably oh, wasn't boy. allowed to watch it. But you're just, you're just <laughs> no, but, to be fair, nobody should have been allowed to watch Tilt, but that's, it, uh, <laughs> no, it was, it was not very good. I mean, like the whole premise of the show is built on like cheating and stuff. So really, really, dang, okay. I, mean, I don't even remember it, but, but like as a kid, it was just like, you know, this poker show. And yeah. So, sure and so it was cool so uh yeah i started started playing like friendly and like starting to like cards and like the game uh as a kid and then one of the other one of the older brothers of uh of one of the guys in the neighborhood i actually think that we ended up later competing in chess throughout high school but he told us that if we would take this online hour survey you would get a free play of ten dollars on poker stars and so we would just sit around the computer and like take these surveys and try to run it up in these like three person sit and go free play things, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's always funny cause I never really played poker pre black Friday, but I kind of did, you know? And I, and I always joke that that's why the, you know, poker was so soft back then because you had, you know, 11 year old kids, <laughs> 15 year old kids, like trying to spin it up in the three handed sit and go. So, uh, how do you so have an account at 11? how do you I honestly have, I have no idea. <laughs> like, these, like my older brother was like 15, 16. So I assume that they kind of had the, you know, intellect to, to figure it out to however we got these $10 on there. But, but uh, I was just the one who would watch this long survey. And then, you know, they would just put me to work on, on that stuff. So, uh, wow. so that's that kind of like my, my uh, introduction to poker. And then like, you know, as, as a kid, I had a lot of other interests. So it kind of, uh, like hit the back burner through high school and, and most of college. And then I started playing more seriously towards the end of college. Uh, you mentioned chess. Um, and I know that you played soccer too. So tell me about like that competitive spirit and nature it, leading up to, you know, rediscovering poker. Wow. So, so I really just like, you know, I was definitely one of those like bratty little kids that hated to lose at anything. Um, you know, when you're really young, you're just like crying anytime you like lose to your older brother or something uh and i was i don't know i mean i think i was just really fortunate that my older brother was four years older it's like he would just beat me at everything until i reached a certain age until i could like actually compete with him you know what i mean because the age gap is just too big that i just got destroyed at anything we would do for years and years and years and it like kind of put this just like burning desire there that like i just had to win i had to win so i think it like made me just really competitive and uh, and everything. And then in high school, I played, uh, chess. I wasn't like an expert at chess, but I was, you know, the best in the school and, and one of the better ones in, in like the city. Uh, but my main focus in, in terms of like competition was, was soccer at the time. Uh, you know, really focused on improving and trying to play at a really high level. Uh, yeah. I just, I think I was lucky as a kid to like grow up in an environment that competition was like really um kind of enjoyed and and uh like an everyday thing for for myself and and kind of like how our family was set up so let me so it's an interesting point you made about you know getting shut down by your brother in everything growing up right like just never winning uh 
how did, how is your brother now? Like, as it relates to competition, sports, stuff like that, did he develop the same drive as you, that same burning desire to like, just be the best he could be and overcome adversity and all that stuff? Because it's like a, it's a different experience being the older one who's just kicking the shit out of your younger brother yeah. and everything, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's definitely like very ambitious. He doesn't have as many like competitive outlets. He did the whole, I mean, he was very much like first, first born, like perfect child, straight A student. You know, he he went to med school, became a doctor, married at 22, first one to produce the grandkids for the baby, for you know, for my parents. So, wow, uh, he was definitely like very focused and and ambitious to achieve at a high level. But I definitely think that I got more of the competitive, you know. Uh, like competitive nature and, and i'm not sure if that's because my outlets are naturally more competitive than, than his or be, because of you know things that happened when we were young and, and that shape shaped a little bit more but but yeah he, i mean he is he is very like ambitious and driven um but he just isn't as like competitive competitive to like pick up something new and, and try to become really good at it or something like that yeah i mean adversity certainly builds something inside yourself right like when you're you you have that mountain to climb, which is like beating your brother at anything. Like you're going to naturally put in a lot of effort and display a lot of heart and grit and determination. Whereas like you're his little brother, right? So he can just yeah. squash squash you without you know breaking a sweat. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, so rediscovering poker, right? You you mentioned that you you know your family set up very, uh, to enjoy competitive outlets and your brother's a high achiever. He went to med school, all that stuff. I believe that, you know, your dad is an engineer, right? So like your, your family is very, um, high level professionals, ambitious. So tell me what did that look like for you? Like going through school, what was your aspiration? And then how did poker kind of tie into all that? So Hmm. So, so I think like my, in reality, when I went to school, my aspiration was in soccer still, you know, like when, when things like really, like my freshman year, I wasn't a great player. Um, I, I mean, good enough to like, you know, be on the team and, and be training, but it was kind of the same thing where it was like, I wasn't quite at the level I had to improve. I had to compete every day to get to a level where I was able to like, you know, be a starter, be a, be a, be a good player for the team and so i kind of had that same sort of like feeling to break through a little i mean i don't know if that's the right term but like i still had to like you got a chip on your that, shoulder right yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah great way to say it um and then so once i kind of got good enough then the aspiration was okay i want to you know play soccer professionally after this uh so that was definitely the aspirations in college like i, I studied engineering um, but but it wasn't really uh, high on my priority list. I was, I was much more inclined to, um, you know, be watching film or be in the weight room or, you know, be in the gym working on my technique. And and so I think that my real aspiration throughout college until about the end of my junior or start of my senior year was solely in soccer. And I just played poker for like a fun little, you know, fun game. Um, so what happened to soccer? So, so eventually I, I just didn't quite get good enough, honestly, like post-college I had, a, I had some combines, like I, I had a combine with Toronto FC and MLS, I had a, you know, a couple weekends with some minor league teams. Um, but, but I think what happened was that I just wasn't quite talented enough and that I didn't quite work hard enough to like make up the gap. Um, like, like I really think like if I would have just committed more time to getting better, I could have probably made the jump, um, but I just wasn't naturally talented enough. And then I got too distracted in college. Tell, tell what, me, you know, yeah. Tell me about how, how did it feel when that you know your dream of soccer died, and then what did things look like after that? Yeah, dude, it was it was a it was like an identity crisis for sure. I mean, for I'd played since I was as long as I could remember, probably three or four. I'd been a student athlete for as long as I could remember through middle school, high school, you know, college. Uh, and then all of a sudden it was, it was done. It felt, it felt like my, you know, whole identity had just like 
came crashing down on me and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and so I, this was, I graduated, like if you want to go pro, you, gra- you try to graduate in December because the MLS draft is in March. And so it allows you to finish your degree and then still play. Whereas if you graduate in May, you have to leave a semester early and like figure out when to make up the semester later. So I graduated December. I was traveling around doing these combines, like trying to go pro. And then I just like didn't get drafted, didn't get signed. And I was just living with my parents come April. And it was just like, what the hell do I do? You know, I, 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 I was pretty lost. And um, at the time I was playing a lot of poker. And so I just kind of fueled like all that negative energy into just like playing and grinding and like trying to figure out something, you know, I was, I, I was definitely a mess for a while there, but, but I just tried to like channel that, that energy into, you know, something else because I didn't have to train anymore. You know, I'd, I'd spent infinite hours practicing soccer and, you know, getting in good shape and all those things. And all of a sudden I didn't need to anymore. So it, it would definitely had a period of like being really upsetting. And then I was just able to kind of fuel that into, well, I have something else to work on now. Let's try to get good at poker. And that, that was uh, a, that, that, that was like a big part of the transition. Yeah. It's, it's pretty brutal. Just even when you have success as an athlete, it can be brutal. Like the Olympics are going on right now, uh, maybe completed by the time this podcast airs, but like, you know, there's a lot of depression that Olympic athletes go through even after winning gold, you know, they've trained for four years for this one thing and then it's over. And then it's like, well, now what do I do? Right? Like, and and it's not something that I, I mean, it's getting more and more talked about these days, but even like football players who have a hall of fame career suffer identity crisis when it ends because they've, they've spent their whole lives pursuing this one thing. And then it's just gone. And then it's like, holy shit, what do I do now? Luckily for you, you found poker and that's a great competitive outlet. Uh, you mentioned you graduated. What, what was your degree? And then did you have any like serious thoughts of, you know, pursuing an occupation with that degree? Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to add re- really briefly about, uh, about the athletes, because like that, it's been really cool to see that in the, uh, like so much, uh, it, it's been a more okay to talk about. And I beca- I ended up becoming so grateful that it happened to me at a younger age, because like, I know a lot of poker players now who, who their identity is very much poker. And I always, and I keep thinking to myself, like, look, like you can't do that because at some point it's going to end. And like, n- now I feel like, like it really allows me to not put my identity into random things like that, where it's like, I, I much prefer to, you know, be kind to other people and like be generous and, you know, have fun. And these things that like, are never going to change uh, instead of things like, you know, soccer, poker, you know, if you're just a poker player, someday it's going to end and you're going to have the same, the same feeling. So uh, yeah. it, it's cool to be seeing how like open those athletes are and, and, uh, what, what and, do. and not just it's going to end one day. It's like anytime you suffer any extreme amount of adversity, right? Like you are going to hit a, you know, bottom 3% run and like (laughs) so like when your identity is as a high level poker player and you're getting your teeth smashed in every day for like months it feels bad you you suffer you 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 know you have these existential crises and it's really hard to recover if like that's the only thing that you have going on and if that's the only way that you view yourself is as a poker player so you know a lot of greatness bombs in that um just little tidbit that you you added there and so let's yeah circle circling back to your career what were your what were your goals there yeah so i graduated um chemical engineering and, and actually both my parents were chemical engineers. So I just kind of like followed in their footsteps a little bit. And, you know, I, I really didn't think about it too much, honestly. Like, I think I worked like somewhat hard in some of the classes, uh, but I was never a great student in college. And because I was so focused on soccer and other things, like I, I honestly like never really gave myself like career aspirations in engineering. I think like once things started crash, you know, coming down on soccer, it became more um, possible, you know, just because like there was no other option, it, you know, there weren't many options at the time. Yeah, it's um, a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to be yeah. filled by something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, 
so like during that, like, I, I mean, I really liked propulsion, you know, in, in college, I worked like part-time at this advanced high temperature materials lab. And like, I love the guys I work with. Um, they worked on like really cool projects. I mean, pretty much they would just like heat stuff up to like incredibly high temperatures and then break them and then measure their properties. I mean, that was essentially what we were doing all day long. And it was, you know, the testing wasn't like extremely exciting, but then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that's going to be on like curiosity. It's going to Mars or, you know, that like doing like pretty high level research um, for things that were pretty interesting. I, I, I did like that stuff. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of went back and forth on, you know, what I would want to do. But it, at the end of the day, a lot of chemical engineering jobs are very much like in the paper mills with, with a hard hat and, you know, at a corn syrup plant and, and things like that. And that, that was completely unattractive to me. And, and so that I, I didn't spend too much time thinking about it because it would just make me upset if I was like, man, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing. So uh, I was definitely going to do something unique with, with the engineering degree. I never really thought I would, um, you know, work as like a chemical engineer. Uh, what do you mean by unique? Actually would. Uh, like a lot of people go from something like chemical engineering into medicine or into, um, you know, aerospace engineering or material science, uh, biochemistry, you know, like things like that, that's, that's, less get a four-year degree and then go work in industry and more so like all right i developed skills from this curriculum let me use those skills in like a similar but specialized more uh, specialized, exactly, yeah. more specialized field and, and do something a little bit more interesting uh yeah i mean pharmaceuticals or something like that a anything that wasn't in a uh like factory <laughs> I don't think I would have done so well. In that. <laughs> my one of my first jobs was in a factory, um, and it was not any high level work. And I can tell you, it was the worst. Really, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. The worst three months of my life. Um, yeah, as like a seventeen or eighteen year old kid. Um, tell me then, have you done or have you pursued anything unique with within the realm of engineering, or did poker just kind of? you know, swallow up that hole. Yeah. It was just, it was just poker at the time. Um, I mean, and now, right. So like, I, I never really pursued anything in, in engineering. I mean, I applied. So, so towards the end of school, I was starting to think to myself, like I need some backup plans and I'm very much the type of person to, I will just try to have as many options as possible and then figure out and then procrastinate the decision. <laughs> I mean, that's, that is exactly what I did. Paradox of choice, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, everybody says, you know, it's like way, way better just to like choose early and, you know, start on the path or whatever. But for my, I just, I don't operate that way. And it's maybe something I can improve. Uh, uh, I don't think so. Like I, I think, and I haven't studied this in great detail, but I know that like Gretchen Rubin wrote a book on just the way that specific people are made up. And you remind me a lot of a maximizer, like, I'm a maximizer. So like I always, I'll like, whenever I'm looking to buy something, I'm like comparing everything and reading the reviews because I like, I want to buy the best thing. I want to maximize yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. this choice, right? And like some people are just constructed that way. And I think that's just who they are. And so like, I think that, you know, just, I think just accepting your nature for what it is, is probably the best path. No, I, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's cool. So, you know, you're, maximizing you're figuring out you have all these redundancies in place you're trying to choose something and then was it just you're spending lots of time playing poker you're enjoying poker and it just stood out as the obvious most no-brainer choice i'm not sure if it was a no-brainer choice so i i played a lot towards the end of college i i tore my ac joint in my shoulder and so i didn't travel with the team for a while and as I was falling out of shape, not being so happy about, uh, how'd you uh, tear your shoulder joint in soccer? So I, I was a goalkeeper and I just dove and the ball got deflected. And I, so I, I kind of dove to my right and then I reached back to, to try to knock the ball out. And so it was like this weird motion with my shoulder and then I landed and mm. it just kind of tore. And so I, I didn't end up getting surgery. Um, but I was probably out for 10 to 12 weeks or something, something like that in the season. Um, and I'd been playing a little bit of poker, but it gave me a lot more time because all the guys were traveling on the weekends and I, you know, what wasn't, wasn't fit and with the team. So 
I was playing a lot then. And then as we got towards this, you know, I'm not playing soccer anymore. It, I'm not sure if it was like the obvious easy choice, but it was something that like kind of excited me at the time. And so starting to play more and learn more uh, was definitely, was definitely like my first option. You know, I understood that I wanted to move out of my parents. Like I wanted to start my life and all those things. And poker wasn't the first option to do that. But in terms of like what I spent my time on, I, I did really enjoy it. Um, and so I kind of chose the, the, the fact that I enjoyed doing that more so than like going to get a job and starting my life. So I kind of st- I kind of like put my life on pause a little bit to see if I could kind of make it happen. So I have, I have two questions and I'm not sure the right sequence to ask, ask them. Okay. Yeah, um, I guess the first question is, you know, you were diving in and learning, you know, using your engineering background, problem solving, trying to figure this game out. What were the steps that you took to really expedite the growth process? So I tried to just look at every single piece of content that was out there. I mean, I, I remember I, I probably own almost every single poker book there was at the time. And I just got on every single training site. I remember like, you know, before I really knew Jonathan or, or, you know, other content creators, I remember like Key Lee had a cash game fundamentals section or something like that. And I was just filling my notebooks with, with content, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I've never met Key Lee. He seems, seems like a nice guy, but uh, yeah. So I remember he had something on crush life poker. And then I did the, Ale- I, I had plenty of Alex Fitzgerald notes on HUDs, you know, cause online poker, I was, I was just trying to learn, you know, what the heck this thing was and, and how to use it well. And, and so I really just like dove in and tried to learn every single thing that was like publicly out there for four beginners. I read all of Jonathan's books. Uh, but those were obviously super helpful at the time. And, and yeah, I just like really just try to dive in and, and learn as much as possible. And at what point did you sort of realize that like, ah, oh, there's a path here. Like this is a thing that like maybe I can do it well into the future. And then second follow up to that question is like, how did your parents feel when you decided to go down that path? Yeah. So it, it's so interesting because like the path that like the path that seems most like, like it's really easy for me to be like, Oh, at the start, I saw this path that I could get really good. But to be honest, I was just like so mature and didn't really understand the game of poker at a super high level that once I learned everything, I was the best player I knew. So I thought I was the best. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I didn't know these poker players. And, and so I was reading all these books and none of my friends were doing it. And I was playing online and I thought I was really good at poker. And so like, to me, the path looked like a no brainer, clear and simple. Like I'm the best, you know, I'm, I'm going to be super good. And then you start, like learning more and more and more. And you're like, I suck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's all, that's the evolution, right? Yeah. 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 And even now, even now, you know, I've spent infinite hours studying and learning and like, I still think like, I mean, there's just so much to learn. The game is so difficult. It's incredibly complex. And so, but I think a lot of players, like at the start, you start learning certain things and you're like, wow, I'm three betting to the right size. I'm not limping. You know what I mean? Like, like the first evolution of poker and you're like, I'm the best player I know. So it, it definitely, uh, it definitely felt like it, it didn't, I didn't have a clear sight of what an actual path looked like, but I thought the path was like already set in stone, but like at that time, you know? Um, yeah. Another, like an interesting thing I've learned as it relates to like course creation and coaching and teaching is like trying to get to the root of why things work the way they do, all the mechanisms in place and yeah, poker yeah. is hard. And you yeah. really realize the complexity of the game when you're trying to figure out like what's going on here. Like, why do we check raise in this spot? Like wh- what, what do we gain by check raising? Why not check call? Like just all these questions that seem very basic, but then like when you get to the root of like all the whys, you start realizing, well, one thing is like, holy shit, like strategically I've played this game at a very high level for a long time without ever like really understanding the mechanics of like everything that's going and going on behind the scenes and underneath the water. I think that's something that like players can get good by following 
strategies and deploying great strategies without ever realizing like exactly why those strategies are performing the way that they are. Yeah. Um, that's something that like I, I've really learned these last couple of years is like, you know, Jason Kuhn, Jason Kuhn probably set me on this path when he just said like, you know, I wanted to know like what's happening in poker, like what, what's going on in this game. And like, once I kind of figured that out, then like I could play all the games at a high level. And I was like, Mm, that's smart. So yeah. it begs the question, what the fuck is happening in this game, right? Yeah, that's um, awesome. awesome. But yeah, that's that's like, there's always another mystery. There's always another problem to solve. And, and that's just, I'm resigned to the fact that that's how it's going to be until I die, even if I study this game every day for the rest of my life. And, you know, that's the joy of poker, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah, just, sure. we honor that complexity. And that's why we love playing this game so much. Yeah, so anyway. I, I love that. No, I mean, like, just I really like Jason Kuhn. I, like, he, he's it's like just such a good, such a good guy for the community. Uh, you know, he, he's just a cool, cool guy to be around and 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 and, uh, and even play with the tables and things like that. Uh, one thing that Acevedo said a long time ago that I really liked, Michael Acevedo. He has some quote, and I'm gonna butcher what exactly he said, but but the root of it is like. It's such a mistake to try to memorize solver outputs. You want to try to like take in, you know, equity range as pot odds, like MDF, equity realization, all the concepts into your head. And like, and then it was like semicolon. And it was like, you want to become the solver. And like, I, that one just like always stuck with me. It's like, yeah, if you just understand all the mechanisms with like how things are operating, like you are trying to train yourself to like be able to be a live solver. You know what I mean? Like something yeah. happens in game and your brain just takes in all the information and then outputs the strategy because you understand the mechanisms at such a high level. And like, yeah. that's, yeah. that's definitely the goal. I mean, I, I love that. I yeah. Love I mean, that's the, you know, that gives me goosebumps a little because I, I'm going to sound arrogant here and I don't, I don't want to sound arrogant, <laughs> but I think I've, I've already prefaced it that way. So yeah, I've yeah. Pri primed everybody to think, think of me in that way. But like there's, members of, you know, Greatness Village, my community, who play poker at a very high level, who are very Pio theory solver driven and are able to use those tools at way higher level than I aspire to, basically. But an interesting thing happens as it relates to cash games, because I've been playing the games for so long that I can kind of spookily predict what the solver output will be in spots, despite not studying solvers at, at a very high level. Like, uh, I know that like one guy specifically in the group, he's like a 10, 20 and L crusher. Um, he's like, it really pisses me off. Like, he's like, <laughs> yeah. you can, like, like you, you can, like, you'll find some like weird line or whatever, and then bring it to me as like an exploit. And then I'll plug it in. And like, it's, per it performs better than like the output without that weird line as an option. And, and it's like, it's really gratifying to see, I guess it kind of like, cause I've had my own existential crises as it relates to learning and growing as a poker player, because one thing I know for sure is there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's more than one way to approach learning this game. So I've, I've had existential crises of like, man, maybe I've messed up. Maybe I should have been investing all my energy into like learning the solver outputs and less on like, you know, thinking about the way that humans construct ranges and the psychological aspect of it and, you know, all these other things that are like my, you know, my um, bread and butter. But then I just realized like he's awesome at what he does and he, he the game makes sense in the way that he studies it. And I come to a lot of the same conclusions on my own, the way that I study. And like, that's just okay, you know? And yeah, yeah that quote by Acevedo, like that's that's really awesome because that is the goal, right? Like a solver is just a calculator. And if you change the inputs, the outputs will be affected. And like the reality is you're playing against human beings. So you need to know how to manage all those inputs and then the outputs will come to you in your brain and then it's just on you to execute. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, I, I love all that. I, I, I definitely have a buddy who, who is uh, eerily similar to, to you in that regard where it's like, he is just like, I'm much more well studied. And then all of a sudden he'll take this like, very odd line that like can't possibly be good right and then you just like start looking into it more like yeah it's good yeah it's just like you're just like you're his like natural intuition about the game lead like he does some 
very odd things too, but is like natural int intuition will lead to like really sharp, unique lines in, in, in parts of the game tree that if I haven't studied, I won't get to as often, you know? I mean, if, I, if I'm well studied and I'm obviously going to get to it and then and it'll be fine, but like he won't be studied in it and then his intuition will, will bring him there kind of, you know, eerily similar to, to yourself. So it, that's it, why I think like natural talent is still a thing. You know, I, like this, it's definitely still around that, that some people just like, natural inclination of strategy is just better than somebody else's, you know? I agree with you. And I think for a long time, I thought the gap was much larger than I think it actually is. Like, I thought that, like, it was all natural talent in poker, oh. you know, like pre, you know, like from 2005 to like 2012 or whatever. It's like, yeah, like some people get it and some people don't. And like, I, ha I would have no idea how to teach this to somebody that just does it. it they don't understand pot odds. They don't understand like, the makeup of strategy and like, you know, the fact that like, oh yeah, we just call here sometimes because like we need good hands on the rivers. And if you raise all your good hands, then you're just going to fold too much on the river. Like that's a very simple concept that for some folks is hard to grasp. Um, but I, I think I'm coming around to the, the, the gap being smaller, I think than most people believe it is. I think you can study your way to being a winning player. Most, most people can't. Like, I think most people can study their way to winning, like beating one, two, no limit live. I think that's like, a, no matter yeah. how efficient of talent you are, I think you can do that. Um, but yeah, for sure. There is natural talent and there are people that like just kind of show up on the scene and like they're 20 years old and they're just like, who the fuck are you? Where did yeah. you come from? Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like sure. how are you so good? And yeah. that's, that's talent, right? And you mix talent with hard work and very powerful tools. We see some supernovas. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's actually so funny, Brad, because my mindset was always the complete opposite in, in terms of like what I thought, like I thought at the start. And when I, when I first started like taking poker very seriously, I was always under the impression that there was no natural talent at all. It was only the guys who worked the hardest that became the best. And then over time, I thought that gap got bigger and bigger because I was starting on the other side of it than, than you were, you know what I mean? So but we're, we're probably reaching this where we kind of see things like almost in the same way, but coming from, from different directions. Because like at the start, I was just like, if I study something that you haven't studied, like how can you possibly play the spot better than me? You know what I mean? Like, like if I'm, if I'm competent and, you know, low jack versus button when I'm checking range and you bet, and I just like develop my check race strategy better than you do, how are you going to play better than me? You know what I mean? Like in that spot. And mm -hmm. then you start to realize like, okay, some people just like understand naturally that like the button isn't like maybe best too much or whatever it is in their games. You know what I mean? Like when they, when they check in the low jack, the button doesn't realize that they're checking range. And so they bet too often. And so they just like mash them with like these, weird check raises that like you would never see a solver happen because like, it just doesn't have enough equity or, or for whatever reason and uh and then i start realizing like wow they just like have a really good natural <laughs> natural inclination so yeah i definitely came from it from the opposite side that, that, than you did yeah it's i think that like probably mine was just having success early on and then yeah. that leading to some kind of arrogance right on my part and then also seeing like victor blom right like i think victor Bl Bl blom is like the classic example of just kind of a savant who like oh yeah i want to learn plo let's just play heads up against Durr. like yeah. <laughs> you know it's like the, the guy is um from people that have had lots of experiences battling victor blom just say that like you know if he were to study like one specific discipline of poker he'd be the best at whatever discipline he chose to spend his energy learning um he just cool. he just like bounces around you know and uh but yeah he's i think he's like the best example of just pure natural maybe stewie younger too you know i think stewie younger it from all the stories feels like naturally talented card player yeah, had to be right had to be had to be um yeah. Going back to you know, going back to you though, we didn't we didn't talk about your parents and how they felt yeah. about about you fully pursuing poker. Yeah, so so I am super fortunate that both my parents are um, you know like strong professionals, like worked really hard, all, all those things. And so I think a lot of people in this situation where you have parents that kind of expect you to to be doing similar things you know, going to get a master's, going to get a PhD, like things like that, that they would, wouldn't have been as supportive, but my parents, I mean, like, I love my parents. Like they're just, they're just really wonderful people. And they were unbelievably supportive of, 
of whatever I wanted to do. Maybe even a little bit to a fault because like it kept me at home a little bit longer. And they, you know, <laughs> and, and I think that they just like, I think they just like really liked having me around. And like, you know, when you live together with your parents post college, you, it definitely puts some stress in the relationship because like I just lived in my own for four and a half years. And now I'm at the house for months. And, uh, and so there's definitely some stress there, but yeah, my parents are always super supportive. And like, I feel like even now, like they're just my, you know, some of my biggest fans and always so supportive of whatever's going on. So, uh, there was definitely no stress in that regard in, until I decided to move to Vegas. Once I moved out and moved really far, then there was like a little bit of like, they're still really supportive, but they, <laughs> but they kind of would love for, you know, yeah, not to move so far away. <laughs> so so when did that come about? Like, I know, so let's talk about your path. Like after you pursue poker in full, um, I know that eventually you start working with Jonathan and I believe it was a private coaching relationship in the beginning. Yeah. So yes. tell me like, tell me that story and, yeah, then, so I, and how I, you ended up going to Vegas. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, you know, everybody talks about skill and all these things. I got so unbelievably lucky in, in this part of my life because like who in the world just like reaches out to a pretty famous pro in Jonathan and then is given the opportunity that I was given at the time. Like, like it was, it was so, so lucky, but essentially like towards the end of college, I direct messaged Jonathan asking for coaching. I was playing 25 and now on ignition, just kind of like breaking even like, you know, not obviously like not playing super well. DM'd him for coaching. He gave me his rates. I said it's too expensive. And then I started looking through like his poker coaching site and I'd read all of his books and I, I knew kind of the way he taught, like at least from a, a reasonable level. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I, I reached out to Jonathan and pretty much like told him, Hey, is there any chance that I could like do work for you in exchange for coaching? And so he said, yeah. And so I started just like doing busy work tasks for him and his company. And uh, he would coach me once a month or once every two weeks in, in these games. And that relationship kind of went on after, and then I graduated. Um, and that kind of went on like while I was trying to play it more seriously. But I was so immature uh, at the time in poker. And so I ended up getting up to like 100 and now 200 and now. I was beating 200 and now for infinite hands. But then I would go play 2K and now. And I, I would go broke. And then I would build it back up in 200 now. And dude, I mean, like talk about immature. I would be sitting there. Like I had an, I had like an office in my parents' house. And when I was in the office, I was very focused. You know, I was like competing as if it was like an Olympic sport, you know, like in 25 and 100 and up in these games. And then I would like, for some reason, have this arrogance that after dinner, I would sit on the couch with my dad, would be watching Netflix and I'd be two tabling 2K and out just like against guys who are so much better than me. I have no business being in this game. Meanwhile, I'm just like four betting the ace and I know and just like, you know, being a total idiot. Uh, why do you think so, that happened? Like, why do you think? I think it was just like, an, I, I wanted to get rich quick. That, that was definitely, that, that was definitely a mistake. And it was a, a misunderstanding of the game. I, I didn't understand the game at a high enough level to possibly think that I wasn't pretty good at it. And I wanted to get rich. And, and, and I mean, that, that was, that was really just a, a really bad combination at the time because to be like just out of college and grow a 30 K role took a lot of effort and then to torch it in like a week of like playing these games, not even taking them seriously. Like I, it's so like unfathomable that it even happened. Um, what did Jonathan say? So, so that, so that was it, right? He didn't really know, honestly, because I would just sort by 200 and now we would go through hands. I was being 200 now for like three and a half bigs at the time, which like I I thought was pretty good, and uh, which is like probably fine. And I had a really large sample, and then I six months go by, and I go broke for maybe the third or fourth time, just like you know up and down, up and down, kind of the same thing. And I remember texting him and saying like, "Hey man, like I'm done with poker. I'm going to start applying for engineering jobs. Like thanks for everything. I really appreciate it, but like uh, I'm going to just play for fun. You know what I mean? This isn't this isn't isn't for me anymore." And he told me to call him the next day. And so I gave him a call and he was like, what's going on? And I, and I kind of, I kind of told him, you know, what was happening. And immediately he's just like, 
well, why don't we do this? He's like, what are your thoughts about just like working for me full time? And I was like, I, I'm, I don't even know what that means. Like, like, what do you mean working for me full time? And he's like, well, you know, I think you do a good job with, you know, the media and marketing type stuff that you're doing. And it's just, you know, him and another guy on the team at the time is like, I would, I would love for you to come on and just go through every piece of content that myself and other coaches are making and then turn it into small form content. You know, we can make eBooks out of it. We can make webinars out of it. Um, he's like, I pretty much want you just to like go through every piece of content I've ever made and pro coaching coaches have ever made. And so it definitely like gave me another opportunity to like pursue poker. And then on top of that, he was, you know, yelling at me a little bit for, for being an idiot and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and says that he's going to be a little bit more hands-on and, you know, helping me make good decisions with my bankroll, helping me grow it, helping me be more disciplined and, and things like that. And then I started, so, so I was living at my parents' house when that happened. I just want to jump in here for a second. I think it's, Knowing both sides of it, I, it's like hilarious for me from like an outside perspective because I could imagine, first of all, Jonathan gets the the text or whatever and he's like, huh? Like he's just like confused and then he's like, holy shit, that sucks. Like I can't, like Justin went broke. That's that's crazy. And then yeah. he starts like, it starts dawning on him like, oh my God, like <laughs> he does so much work. <laughs> who's going who's gonna to have to do this work like this? X is like this desperation of like, oh my, like I can't, like <laughs> you, you effectively had become like inadvertently kind of irreplaceable where like you're carrying that load. And from somebody that like is in the business of training and building a business, I understand that like those blocks are so valuable to me specifically that yeah. it's like, no, no, no. Let's, what, what do I got to do? Like, what, <laughs> how, how can I help you not do this? Um, <laughs> So you can keep doing this stuff for me. So like, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's just a funny imagery that I had in my head there of like, you know, wanting to help somebody out that you, you love that's suffering, but also from a professional standpoint, like, oh God, like I, I gotta, I gotta resolve this. I gotta figure this out. Yeah. 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 I mean, so I, and, and he was so like quick about it too, which, which was, which was really, really awesome. And, um, and yeah, so that, that was probably like summer of 18 where like I'd been at my parents for like five, six months. Wow. Three broke. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is so, recent. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just graduated. I graduated December 20, you know, 2017 and the draft was March, 2018 for soccer. And so like once April may come, you're not playing soccer anymore. And so that was definitely like, kind of like where, where things started. Um, and so I started working with Jonathan Moore. you know, I started just like essentially he was paying me to study not not something specific but like everything and and so uh yeah during that time i just went through all the content and then from there he kind of like directed me in the right in the right um like learning path essentially like i went through all of his content i went through all the coaches content and then he had me read the will tipton books the game theory books um and then he got me coaching with Acevedo. so i'd gotten coaching with him a lot and then he purchased uh, coaching with Michael Acevedo. Um, and at the time I started like really diving into all the solvers um, and then working with Acevedo just to make sure like all my abstractions were right. Like I was using the programs correctly and just trying to like optimize uh, how I was going about those programs. And then in return, I started running all the sims for Jonathan and, you know, running all the different content related things that, that he needed and that we needed at Poker Coaching. Uh, and, and during that time, Poker Coaching was growing a bunch, you know, we, we brought on, or he brought on, you know, a couple more business side people, which was super nice because I mean, you know how it is, but like when you're in a small team, you're, you're just kind of like, you're wearing all the hats, you know? And so for me, I had no idea what I was doing in some of these regards, but like just doing my best. Um, and so when he brought on Brian, uh, these two Brian's who, who are both just like great, I was able to focus pretty much just on the content which was, which was super nice. And so, and so that was 20, end of 2018. And I was a little bit more settled. I was a little bit, a little bit more mature in poker. So I was, I knew I wasn't going to torch. And so that's when I decided to move to Vegas, uh, January of 19. And I'd kind of plateaued. A li like, I mean, it's hard to say you plateaued in online cash games when like I'd only played for eight, nine months, but like, I wanted to look at live cash games. I, I wanted to think about 
which exact path I wanted to take to try to, try to get, you know, better and better at poker. And I was kind of bored of playing the 200 and now 500 and now ignition games. And so, yeah, moved to Vegas in January of, of 19 with the idea that like, I'm going to start playing live cash games. Like I'll dabble in different games uh, and, and I'll really like immerse myself in the community. And that's, uh, I do want to go back a moment because like, that's very, that's awesome of Jonathan, like super generous too, to onboard Acevedo to give you private coaching and just give you, I mean, it's a great opportunity, right? Yeah. To learn from one of the best coaches in the game and just grow as a poker player. And I have to imagine too, like, um, you know, repurposing the poker coaching content. Uh, I think that there's the best way to learn poker really that I found is in building things and like building out solutions to problems and studying one thing and kind of coming to the answers yourself. Because I know that like whenever I build a new course, I just learn these spots so much more intimately inside and out in the building process. And so like that likely, you know, expedited your growth as a poker player as well. Just the repurposing of the content and putting it together and trying to understand why things work the way they do just makes you a much better and stronger poker player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like can't even fathom how lucky it was that that I was given the opportunity, and and I totally agree with you. I mean, I went through so much of the content, and then in 2019, I built my first like course. You know, it, it was like a it was a pretty quick course, but I still remember all the spots from that. You know what I mean? Like when you build it, I I just I essentially looked at like I think I looked at like four spots or something push flop. It was like. Low jack versus big blind, button versus big blind, low jack versus button, and then three of pots, four of pots. So I guess five, five spots. And like all the examples I used of like just building good fundamental strategies, I'll never forget those, you know, just because like it's the first thing you build and, and, uh, and, and yeah, so I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think it's a, it's an awesome way to like really make it concrete, like, like knowledge about spots. Cause you have theories, right? And you're testing it and you're trying to prove it one way or the other. And so like you throw a bunch of stuff out, you, you understand like, oh, that doesn't work because of X, Y, or Z. And yeah. then you throw something else out and then you realize like, oh, this is great. Like, I think this is executable. This is awesome. It outperforms all the other things I've looked at. And then like, it just, it just resonates. It just like gets cemented into your brain and you just know it very intimately. For sure. The decision to enter a hand is fundamental to poker strategy. Too tight, and they know what you have. Too loose, and you're easy to run over. Free Flop Bootcamp from Chasing Poker Greatness is a comprehensive guide to locking down your pre-flop game and creating true range advantage. Eight days of guided training, over 60 optimal ranges, and access to a dedicated community of players that will push your pre-flop game from a place of weakness to your greatest strength. Go to chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp. Available now. Yeah, before bootcamp, I had been playing for maybe 15 years, somewhat seriously, always trying to get better, jumping from learning program to different learning programs and training site to training site kind of feeling a little bit lost, not really knowing how to go about getting better. And Preflop Bootcamp just felt like a great starting point, a way for me to, to move from being a losing player to, to possibly a winning player. It felt like the right first step. Once you jumped in Bootcamp, what was your experience like? Well, first off, I realized that I'd been making a lot of mistakes prior to boot camp, kind of learning what rangers should look like and what hands should be played and what situations, you know, it was, it was exciting because I, I could see what other people had been doing to me, what kind of what I had been missing in my game. And then from there, just the whole camaraderie of everybody that's um, signed up, working together, trying to achieve that goal, you know, that, that was fun. That's uh, pushing each other and really helping uh, one another, kind of feeling like you're a part of a team. It was, uh, it was a great experience. I, I enjoyed the process and I learned a lot. What was your experience like playing cards post boot camp? It's a totally different experience. You know, it put me in a position to be successful as opposed to always being behind the eight ball and, and playing catch up. Um, I really feel like it's it's the foundation of, of a solid poker game. And uh, since boot camp, I've been able to, to turn a profit and keep building on what I learned there. 
you know, being able to go back into the group and uh, re really work together even after boot camp was over, it's it's been awesome. What's your sample size of winning post boot camp? I think I have seventy thousand hands played by now. You know, I'm a father and I have a job, so I'm not a, a professional player by any means. That's my sample size. Preflop Bootcamp is the flagship Chasing Poker Greatness training program. If you'd like to dramatically upgrade your preflop game, a new bootcamp launches on the last Saturday of every single month, and your link to join is ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp, all one word, or you can click through in the description box of this episode. So you move to Vegas, right? You move away from your parents. Your parents are still your biggest fans, but a little, uh, <laughs> <you> <laughs> yeah, yeah. have a little, a little not more thrilled. tentative, not thrilled. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did, how did Vegas go? Like did the live cash game scene turn out the way that you thought it would? What did it look like? I, I couldn't do it, man. I, I I was so unhappy when I first started to just like be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna play 40 hours of live cash a week. Just see how it goes. I mean, it was so slow. All the regs, I was just playing 510, like Bellagio. Like all the regs were really unhappy, it seemed. Nobody enjoyed what they were doing. Everyone was so nitty. They were just like printing a small win rate. Like I I hated it. And like I was like, oh, let me stick this out, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. But I'm telling you that with very, very quickly. I just went back to what I was doing in Ohio and then it kind of went through a, a, like it was pretty lonely. You know, I'd moved to a new city. I was thinking I was going to be in the scene more. I decided like I was not having fun. I, my win rate was fine. Like it, it was, it was, but I was making just as much playing online, playing way more hands. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up just like living in this small apartment by myself and just waking up playing every day and then working and then playing and then working over and over and over and just like door dashing twice a day and you know just kind of grinding unhappily in, in vegas at the start <laughs> that sounds pretty miserable um <laughs> yeah yeah no it was it was not a fun time when i when i first uh when i first moved here for sure yeah so i hope things have gotten better since then yeah um, yeah and if so you know what what changed about the vegas situation i'm trying to think of like what a initially kind of changed with it but but really i just started like meeting meeting people um you know one of my best friends uh aram zobian i met at this like like we had a, you know how, like all the poker group chats go and we, there was like a basketball group chat and so we met at basketball and started talking poker a little more and, and he was a strong tournament player you know still very strong tournament player and then through him i met a bunch a bunch more friends and and, and a bunch of other people and i think i started like just developing a, like groups a little bit, like like developing friendships, developing people who kind of saw the game the way I did, who were who had aspirations that that were similar to mine, and and I really yeah I think that really started to like kind of change my experience in Vegas, um, you know studying with with other people. It, actually, quick quick tangent, but I met Crazy Sixes and God's Big Toe back in Ohio, so they were my first study group, and they kind of like took me under their wing and were so so great. Uh, at that time when I, when I first started to like try to learn poker. And so when I moved to Vegas, I was just in the same study groups. I was playing the same game. So it felt very stuck and then kind of like meeting more people in Vegas and starting to play a little bit different, different games here and there, I think really started to like change, change my experience there. Yeah. They, they say that, you know, your network is your net worth and it is legitimately true. Like you, yeah. you're basically on the grind, playing, learning, growing uh, as a poker player, and then doing your work with poker coaching all day long, not very happy, right? As soon as yeah. you inject friends, especially like-minded friends who have similar aspirations, like you just make that connection. And, and like, you know, it's, it's, this is something I've learned through doing this podcast is that coming up, like I was kind of like you in the sense that like, I'm on my own. Right. I didn't really gravitate towards two plus two. I didn't really gravitate towards study groups. I was just like kind of on my own, learning, growing, doing my own database analysis and just thinking about the game constantly. Uh, and then when I, I start doing the podcast and, and I realized like, holy shit, this is awesome. Like, I love it. And 
I'm just constructed in such a way that I, I want to know like why, like what's the root of this? Why, why is it like make me feel so happy when I turn off these interviews? Um, and I, I realized that like, it's rare to come across your people. And when you do, it, it's awesome. Like you see the, these aspirations that, that you had and that you have, and, and then you just have this connection, right? And so like when you meet pe people in the poker world, it is somewhat rare to meet somebody that has high aspirations like yourself. But when you do, you both immediately recognize that and then it, you gravitate towards one another. And that just makes the journey just so much more fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree with you. And, and, it, and it makes you like more ambitious because it was always a difficult thing kind of being on my own. And I think it, it, it kind of like crippled isn't the right word, but it, it kind of like constrained me a little bit because it took away some of my ambition because I wasn't that joyful about it. You know what I mean? Like I just, I was printing a win rate. I mean, like for a, just out of college, student, I felt like I was making a bunch, you know, like, like I was like super excited about all those things. And, um, but I wasn't as ambitious, like I'm not, I wasn't nearly as ambitious then as I am now because I didn't have like this like camaraderie or joyfulness uh, about my, about what I was doing. It was just kind of like monotonous and work and like, yeah, getting pretty good was fun, but like, no, who the hell cares? You know, like, it, like what I wasn't building relationships, for, like that many relationships from it and stuff at the time. And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like it, once you kind of like find that those groups and, and those types of people, it just makes you twice as hungry, you know, because it's like it's more than just your own success. It's like a a camaraderie of, of people who are just like all trying to trying to reach like a, a very high level, which well, is way more fun than just yourself. If you think about it, you know, you grew up playing a team sport, right? Yeah. And so when definitely. poker became kind of a team sport, it, it just elevates you, right? It, yeah. it you the hunger, the motivation, the drive. I, you know, nobody tell John who co-hosts Tactical Tuesday with me. Um, and <laughs> like we do coaching sessions every week. He's nice. like bought all the courses and like he's crushing it this year. Like his growth as a player is just unbelievable. But like the way in which he loves poker and the way in which he aspires to genuine greatness is like something that I feed off of. I'm like, man, like, yeah, you want to play 2550. Like you want to shot take on live at the bike and battle Garrett and the boys. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I want to do that too. Like, <laughs> like I, I want to be like, you know, how, how far can I go as a player? How far can I go as a coach? Like how, how much can I help you? Like, how can I better serve you? How can I learn more? How can I communicate more effectively? Like, it just, it's such a driving force when you have these people who genuinely aspire to awesome stuff. It's like, holy shit, this is what I've been missing. Like, this is a catalyst inside of me that I've been waiting for to kind of see what the fuck I'm made of, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Dude. Yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, all this has happened kind of in recent memory for you. And so I guess, you know, we're rapidly running out of time here and i haven't um even asked you more than one question <laughs> besides <laughs> besides your journey okay. it, it happens it happens like every time uh yeah, gotcha, gotcha. but um tell me about the lead up to this recent victory that you had um you know you transitioned to mtt's at some point from cash games yeah. How, obviously that transition's gone pretty well better than expected, worse than expected. Has studying MTTs been harder or easier than you anticipated? So I hmm, trying to get all my thoughts on this because that, that was a lot. I say. know. I, I asked like <laughs> 18 questions in, in no, one no, sentence. It's, it's good. It's good. So, so I switched to MTTs more on like a, on a full-time basis once COVID hit. I just wanted something new. Uh, all my friends are playing MTTs kind of switched over and then lead up to this recent stuff has actually not been that great. I, I started playing bigger last summer. I went to Playa del Carmen with some friends and started playing big GG party stuff. Um, so that was kind of my first taste of like high stakes MTTs. What's big have, mean? Uh, like I was playing the five K's and the 10 K's online. Um, selling any, biggest. selling yeah, any, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Selling, selling big pieces at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
and I wasn't like playing them regularly, but like a good 10 count a Sunday, I was like trying to get in and play. Um, all, like the 5K main event, I was in for infinite bullet. Like, I, I was going to fire infinite into it. So I start, started playing bigger like last summer um, and I got pretty buried. And then my average ROI was pretty good, but my total ROI was not great. And so <laughs> it means was, you're, you're winning the wrong tournaments. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So like I was crushing the 215s and the 630s and my winning rate was, was high on those online, on those online tournaments, but I was not getting it done in the high stakes. And it's kind of like hung over my head a little bit this year as well, because like, you know, this year I started first playing live. So I got my first live cash in like January or something. And I've been playing all, like pretty much or a lot of the big stuff. I mean, I fired the 50 K in Florida. I fired the 25 K in Florida. I've been playing a lot of the live 10 Ks. Uh, Tell me about f- firing the 50 K. I mean, that's, that's a pretty, pretty yeah, big that job. Was, that was crazy. Um, I was playing an 1100. And the way that the setup was in this 50 K is that it was single re-entry into this tournament. And I was playing the 1100 at the time and I had no intention of playing the 50 K. It would look tough. That's out of my buy-in range. Never played a 50 K before. Um, and I get a text from a buddy who's like, Hey, we can't re-enter again. And the two guys who have all the chips are massive whales. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. so, so if you get knocked out, come over, like come here, we want you to play this 50 K. Okay. So I'm not, thinking like I'm was not planning to play this tournament and I bust the 1100. Tell me, Max, how did you feel when you busted the 1100? It nope. was weird, dude. It like was that, weird. You, you, I actually probably have to feel a little like giddy, like, oh yeah, this is, I get to go. You know, it's so funny because in the time I definitely felt that. And then I look back and I'm like, man, I had like 12 or 15 X starting in the 1100. And then I ended up just like busting everything that trip. <laughs> and I'm always just like, man, at the time, it was pretty cool to go play the 50k. But once I started, once I busted everything and didn't catch a tournament, I'm like, maybe if I, maybe I should have been a little more upset. You know, no, you you oh, for sure it. punted. Like I, I feel like you <laughs> just for sure, like subconsciously punted the 1100, knowing it's, the 50k. I, I, I actually I check jammed the river as a bluff in like kind of this weird spot against an old man. So it's, it's certainly <laughs> possible. <laughs> it's certainly possible that it was, it was a little punty. He there checked the turn with a flush. It was really surprising. Mm. I don't see people like that not bet their value that much in the turn. He checked back a flush and then I checked river and had decent blockers and he like bet medium size in the river. And so I just jammed for infinite and he tank called the king high flush. And I was like, oh my God, how did he have that? <laughs> like, it's, it's like, I think it was an okay play because like- Yeah, it's not very punty. Play. It sounds sounds like a pretty decent spot actually. Yeah, yeah. But but we'll stick to the check jam the river versus an old man in an 11 yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, so I, I run over- to the friends i'm like hey like i, I busted They're like okay you have you have 20 minutes so we go to the cage to get out cash and figure out how we're gonna how we're gonna break up the equity and um it takes forever to get this to get the cash from from seminal cage and time is running out to enter this tournament so i end up getting this 50k of cash in the poker room i don't know if you're familiar with seminal but where the tournaments are is very far from where the actual poker room is so, i know where the, i know where the poker i've played cash there but i've never played the tournaments okay so it's like uh, the tournaments are like across the whole casino, essentially. Nice. And Sweet. I have like two minutes. Yeah, yeah. And I have like two minutes to get there. So I get this like package of 50k cash <laughs> and I start sprinting to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, buddy's like calling Tony Burns or, or you know, some one of the directors there and uh, saying like, hey, this guy's running to, the, to max that reg the 50k. So make sure to, you know, let him in, whatever, whatever. But I Soccer. didn't know this, so I'm just sprinting across. Soccer training coming into play here. like Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm like sweating like crazy, walking into the room, regging the 50K with 20 bigs or something. And, you know, I had a, had a good table and ha- had a good shot. It's like, I, I didn't end up cashing, but it was definitely a cool experience. And, and it was one of those spots where it's, it's just like super interesting how like the EV of those spots work. When like, if you take away the top few players, you know, two of the two or three of the top few players that can't re-enter again because of the structure. And then the businessmen have the money. Like it was definitely a cool spot just to like kind of print. Uh, so yeah, t- t- took a big shot and, and it, it didn't work out, but it, it was definitely fun. So, and then the rest of the trip didn't go so well. I would planned to play the 25 K. So uh, that one I was like more prepared for, uh, but, but didn't cash in anything there. Uh, but that, that was kind of like, 
just started like playing like pretty big, pretty big live stuff. Uh, and so like actually before the 5K when things hadn't, it's not like things had just been going super smoothly. Like I, I'd, I'd been losing in the high stakes, um, you know, losing, right? Like I, I feel like I've been, been, been theoretically winning in them, but, but my win rate was not, wasn't there. And I mean, the sample wasn't there either, but. Uh, it, it sounds like you're enjoying, was, enjoying live MTTs a lot better than live cash. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For, for sure. I, I think dude, like, I don't know if, if I've just been lucky that I haven't played the same, like equal stakes of, of live cash. Like I'm sure if I play like a nosebleed live cash game with a bunch of interesting people, I bet I would really love it. You know what I mean? For sure. But, I for sure would. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but like playing a, a random five ten game on a Tuesday evening with, you know, the same dusty regs that have been there for ten years, like that was just not enjoyable at all. And so I think that's one reason why I'm liking live MTTs so much because like, when you're playing like an Aria ten k with thirty people, for four days straight, it's just like a pretty enjoyable group of guys, like pretty pretty unique people, really sharp people, really fun to battle. Um, so yeah, I, I've definitely really been really been enjoying that and i'm i'm super looking forward to the next few months of of live entities yeah man so tell me you buy into a 5k uh with a wsop bracelet on the line tell me about it yeah it it was honestly just like another day uh for, for most of it um got a really good table at the start i played this there was a a screen name i'll 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 leave the name off of, but a very like whaley guy um, who I got into it into like massive pots with really early. I played I played a spot where like cut off opened we're like a hundred bigs deep and every, like like we're probably three or four x average stack at the time like me and him and cut off raises I flat tens in the button and he's small blind calls and he squeezes massive in the big blind and I back jam and he just snap calls off king queen off suit for like. 110 Ooh. big something like <laughs> yeah. that and then i and then i win this flip right so i win this massive flip early on just to get a, a huge stack and then we kind of tangled a few other times how many uh, chips did he have if you're if you you win that flip and he's still going i mean dude he he ran up a massive stack <laughs> i i don't remember exactly uh but I, I think i had like 300k at the time and he probably still had like i think i don't even remember what starting stack was maybe Maybe 25k starting stack in the 5k or something. Yeah. Yeah, 30k starting stack. Probably. I think I had like 10x at 300. Um, but yeah, he was just demolishing everybody. You know, snap calling off massive four best, the ace 10 0, you know, winning and, uh, and and running up a stack. So it really just felt like a normal online session. Yeah, I, I was still playing like all my normal schedule with it. And then we started to get like kind of deep and I still had a big stack and I started to get some like, you know, some love from friends who were like sweating, you know, good luck, good luck and, and, and stuff like that. So it started to kind of feel like, you know, this, this could be it, especially because like the past few months have just been like pretty demoralizing in big spots. You know, I, I messed up a hand at the win 3.5 K the week before. Yeah. I think, I, yeah, I think uh, Joe told me that you had, you're pretty upset about a hand. You, you messed up like a big ICM spot. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, my I literally just played this like final table with 350k up top or something and just like totally fucked up a spot and was and was really really just like distraught about it and then you know before that I was one of 12 in the venom with 800k up top Ooh. and I got and I and I bubbled the final table and Ooh. and so like like it kind of you kind of get that feeling like in your chest where it's just like man like here we here we go again kind of you know and so I was trying just to like stay focused stay focused like like just play the spots well and, and let, you know, like you're, you're going to have variance. I think everybody thinks they get 10th through 20th and big events more often than they should, but it's just because you're supposed to get those places way more often than you win them. You know what I mean? Like, a- absolutely. Like, like, yeah, it's just a that, mental barrier. <laughs> yeah. Like when I, I played the 200 sit and goes on party, like nice. a, li- a lifetime ago, like 2004 or whatever. Like, I mean, Bonomo is like grinding the 200 sit and goes like Z Justin. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I remember like there was a stretch where I went like 21 without cashing. And I remember thinking like, 
fuck, that's like 21 final tables <laughs> like, <laughs> without, without getting like one through three. I mean, yeah. the variants can just be extremely demoralizing in MTTs to where yeah. like two guys do all the right things, everything they're supposed to do. And one guy is the hero. And one guy is the sixth place anonymous dude that, you know, nobody knows about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, as, as we got deeper in it, it, it was definitely a weird feeling because I just ran unbelievably hot. And so you end up having this like weird feeling that like, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And then you're trying to like rail that back where it's like, okay, I can't think about that, you know? But yeah. So I, why do you think that is that you like try to squash the feeling of like, I'm going to win. Nah, let's, let's not, let's not focus on that. You know, I, I've talked to a lot, like a reasonable amount of friends about this. Cause some, I have some friends who are like, are like pretty into the to the idea that you know manifesting the fact that you're going to win and, and do really well can only be beneficial but like to me it's just so irrational that i want to be thinking as rationally and like not emotionally as possible especially when you're in the big spots and so i personally do my best to squash all that stuff but i could be wrong i, I mean it it could very well just be like the right thing to do to to like try to let it embolden you. I think right or wrong to me, to me, it's always felt like I, because I understand the nature of these things, you almost don't want to get your hopes up because you feel like that will just crush you even worse if things start going poorly. So the moment you think like, Oh, I got this. Like I, I can see the finish line. Like that's how yeah. tournaments are like, you know, you play a bunch and not much happens. And then all of a sudden you like see the finish line and you're like, holy shit. Like I, I, I can't look, I, I better not look at the finish line. Like I just don't yeah. want to, I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to get my hopes up. And so I like, sure. there, there's a, a measure of that where it's like, when you start like thinking you're going to win and then everything crumbles, like the inevitable devastation is like, but I mean, let's be real here. The devastation is real. And <laughs> no matter what, no matter what you think either way. Yeah. 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 For sure. It, 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 it um it's definitely something i work really really hard at to try to you know not let affect me because like i've definitely had time like when i messed up in that 3.5 kft there was no way i could have played a session the next day i was just so upset like i was fortunate that like i, I was going to chicago um i had a buddy's engagement party that weekend so like i didn't miss a sunday in probably a year and it was actually like the first sunday that i was like skipping and then i was on my flight back and i was like thank God I didn't play because like, there's just no way I could have performed at a high level. And so like, I think that that's like one of the biggest things to, to not be distraught about because like you have to play so many tournaments. Like if, if you want to be really, really good, you can't miss days of not studying hard or not working hard or being distracted for whatever reason. And when I'm emotional, I don't study as hard. I don't play as well. You know what I mean? Like for the future days, like I, I try to work really, really hard at, you know, you get tension in the venom, you know, get the fuck over it. You know what I mean? Like, like what, what's going to help you get better right now is going, is reviewing your hands right now, running the ICM sims, running, you know, some preflop stuff to make sure you're playing better. Like I definitely used to have this tilt thing where I get in a big spot and I'd lose. And I'd always said, I never tilt. And I never tilt, you know? And then I realized like, holy cow, when this stuff happens, I order pot stickers and chicken wings and I go sit in bed and I don't study after my session, which is something I just always do, you know, and then I hit up some women and, and try to like, you know, chat, I'm like, <laughs> like looking for like instant, instant gratification and things. And I'm like, what the hell's wrong with me? Like, I finally realized like, this is me tilted out of my mind. It doesn't, yeah. look, it doesn't look like what normal tilt is, but that's me just so tilted. And it's so destructive. It's so destructive because like, if I go a day without running hands or studying, like I'm falling behind to the people who are. And so it's just like, you can't, you can't be distraught after loss. Like I have found that like for me, if I'm distraught after losses, it is detrimental. It's just detrimental to my growth. Uh, and so like, I try really hard not to, not to let that happen anymore. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. And I would say that like feeling distraught, I, th I think I, I, I'm always of the belief you should feel your feelings no matter what right? It's the act of recovering that is most important. And I think nice, you recover yeah. the fastest when you 
feel all the emotions and you just let yourself go through it. And then you say you're still loved, you're still smart, you're still intelligent, you're still capable, you're still a strong poker player. Um, and then eventually the emotions kind of fade away naturally. And on the topic of the believing you're going to win the tournament or manifestation and all of that stuff, I, the only thing I want to add is one of the most intelligent people that I know and interact with regularly is Olympic gold medalist basically wow. said that before competition, one thing that his crew would say every time, um, was thank you for these nerves. Thank you for this anxiety. Thank you. He would treat it as a blessing wow. because he said that anxiety is energy. This energy is going to allow us to focus. It's going to give us an edge in this competition. And so like, if you funnel, that energy because when you think about winning a tournament and you're like i'm going to win this tournament you can't help but feel energy you can't help but feel that you know that feeling in your stomach that little butterfly that's like holy shit i might win this like i think yeah. that if you channel that productively into focus and energy that you probably can use that to propel yourself to play at a higher level than you would if you try to squash it and um get rid of it so that's all that's all i want to add there um, it's reasonable. That, I know, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, you're focused. You're playing your 5K. Uh, how'd the final table go down? Came in as like a medium stack. Um, I was on Zamani's left, and Zamani was actually at the FT of the win. And I hadn't played the best hands versus him either. So, it definitely felt like a, a little bit of redemption. And uh, I, I knew the players pretty well who were there. I, I played with with a number of them a lot. I came in as a medium stack and I made trips for Samani blind versus blind. Forget, I, I turned trips and the board double paired uh, and he and he called an ace high. And so that kind of like put me maybe in like third or fourth. Like it gave me a little bit of separation between myself and, and the shorter stacks. And then immediately they started colliding. There was just like a three way all in, aces, nines and something else with Doppler and uh, and I forget who else, Boyvin and, and somebody else. And, and from that point, it was like pretty smooth. It just went like collision, collision. We got down to like five or six handed pretty fast. I played, I played the spot versus, Ro I really like John Rorden, McCallum. I think he's a PLO guy naturally. Like he just sits in the high sticks, heads up PLO, but he's been playing a lot of the no limit. And he's a lot of fun to play with, just like a super nice guy. Um, and I played this spot, I opened jacks, the board came like, King five seven or something, and I min bet and he check raise and I called and then turn was like an eight or nine and he jams and I think we're six handed at the time and it like it would have been a massive call but I was just in the tank for a while thinking that like he could just like be turning a lot of bottom pair stuff into a bluff and I ended up folding and later like talked to you know friends about it and everyone's just like yeah that would have been a massive torch <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it definitely felt good I mean they like. The you know the people I talk poker with mostly that I you know kind of kind of listen to uh, well would have just like folded flop, uh, so I think I'll fold flop in the future. But it was it felt like a big spot to make a really big hero call, and then I didn't end up making it, and got um you know reward isn't the right word, but I just got super fortunate from that point because I folded in a spot where I could have just like made the stupid hero call for whatever reason and bust, and then. I just ran so hot. I didn't actually know that Orc in this Orca was Foxing. He had, I don't think his, I don't think he played much on that site. So he was the only one I didn't know who it was. Um, but I got Queens in versus sixes versus him. And then we got four handed uh, and we were all pretty even. He covered by a little bit and then he jammed sevens and I woke up with Kings in the big blind. And like three or four hands later, I raised ace King and Jesse jams ace 10 0, uh, which is obviously fine. And I stack him and yeah. then heads up, heads up, I make a flush. And then I get King Jack in versus five three and win. So it went like it was just so bizarre how quickly and easily it went, you know, five to one, just because I just ran so hot. And and you know, sometimes that happens. And uh yeah, I was definitely very appreciative just to, you know, not not be forced into too many, you know, tough decisions late beforehand and stuff, and just like wake up with the nuts every time for for 20 hands straight. <laughs> First of all, you know, congratulations on taking it down i'm sure you were overcome like with emotion whenever the shot kind of wore off that everything kind of went so smooth uh, I, I was reading the player list afterwards and i saw that 
uh, Jesse got third. Um, and <laughs> Jesse is, you, you know, when you talk about the people that made poker more fun for you in Vegas, uh, Jesse was one of the people, him and Mike Katz, that made poker more fun for me nice. it, at, at Commerce, like Jesse Yaganuma. He's just, he's an amazing person. He's, he's an awesome dude. And like, he'll probably be coming back on the podcast soon. But yeah, was, uh, I saw him, I saw him get third and I was like, oh man, like Jesse, Jesse was in there bracelet hunting too. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually so funny. We'd never, I mean, I, I knew Jesse, you know, we, we, you know, gone out a couple of times and played together a reasonable amount, um, but we'd never played soccer. And uh, one of our mutual friends, Adam Hendricks, started this like soccer group and it had, there's 13 people in this group and we decided earlier in the week that we were going to go play soccer on Friday. And this is Thursday night was the 5k. <laughs> and, and three people in this group are me, Dokler and Jesse. And so Adam starts posting. He's like, man, three of three of the guys in here are, you know, at the final table, like good luck guys. And then we get down, we get three handed. So us three get three handed. Oh my God. We've never played. And we're in this like 12 person group chat together with people sweating and, 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 you know, talking about it and things go so smoothly. And all of a sudden, Jesse, Jesse types in the sock group chat goes, make sure you guys bring your shin guards tomorrow. <laughs> 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 so it, it was, and then we, you know, we all got together the next morning to play soccer and it was just, it was such a funny thing. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's in, really kind of incredible. Like that's, yeah. that is awesome. And Jesse is, Pretty athletic. I would not have imagined Jesse's pretty athletic. He was in our commerce basketball league back nice. in the day. But yeah, he's a he's an awesome dude. I mean, one yeah, of my he, favorite poker players that you know that play cards and travel around, play MTTs, and uh, super high level cash game player too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. So how to feel? You know, you you won your bracelet. You took it down. You kind of got the the monkey off your back as it relates to like the higher stakes tournaments. I mean, even still, you know, you won. What was first for that? Like a couple hundred K, 300 K? Uh, yeah, 250 something. 250. That, that puts a dent in like the 50 K. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, that's the thing, right? It's like all these people are, are you know, giving all these congratulations. Like, oh my God, what are you going to do with the money? I saw them like, you guys haven't like, no idea. I'm getting, I'm getting torched in the 10 Ks, you know? Right. <laughs> like it's, uh, it, you know, definitely didn't end up pocketing me like, life-changing like super life-changing like obviously it was it is great and super and uh super nice but y you don't put 250k in your in your back pocket and walk away you know it's like florida's coming up a lot's just gonna get reinvested like gonna be playing big so uh so yes yeah, it's, it's definitely it was definitely funny getting a lot of like non-poker friends i mean it was super awesome i loved like like giving the support and stuff was definitely what made it feel like super special you know after you win the, uh, after the tournament like it, it it still just kind of felt like another day a little bit. Like I, I kind of couldn't, hadn't quite hit me yet. Like definitely went and had like some champagne with friends and, and had a little celebration, but like went to bed that night just being like, man, that was super lucky. Like it feels really good to, to get lucky in that spot. Like really grateful for that. And the next day, cause it finished so late. Um, the next day, like, you know, hearing from my family, hearing from a lot of the friends, you know, hearing from people I hadn't talked to in a long time, like, like that was really special. And, uh, yeah, I've definitely super appreciated all that. And it kind of put it into perspective a little bit. It's like, man, this like journey I'm on, like other people are supportive. You know what I mean? Like there is a community about it. It's, it's not this like lonely thing uh, anymore. They're on it with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They, they feel the wins just like you do. And, yeah. uh, it, that kind of reminds me of like 21 year old Brad degeneracy. Um, I had a like minor slot machine, problem um <laughs> like yeah. when i was 21 and first entering casinos like just waiting for my poker seat i'm like oh let's play slot machine and then i'm like oh this is like i kind of like this like i get the dopamine hit every time i press the button <laughs> um and like one day being like buried in a slot machine like stuck 6500 or something and like hitting yeah, a jackpot yeah. hitting a jackpot for like 5900 and like everybody's like walking by like congratulations like that's awesome you want to? I, i'm like guys, <laughs> I'm still stuck. Like <laughs> attendant, I hope you don't want to tip because like, I'm still stuck here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, sure. that's the nature of it, right? Like you, you get buried, yeah. you, you win, you have a big score. And like, sometimes you just get unburied, which is a relief, but it's yeah. not exactly, um, it, 
just like you said, it just doesn't go all go in your bank account. It's um, yeah, it, it's part of the process. It's part yeah, of sure. tournament poker. Um, well, cool, man. It's been great having you on. We're gonna have to run it back to yeah. uh, dive deeper. I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and you know, we'll close just by asking if the Chasing Poker Greatness audience wants to learn more about you on the World Wide Web, where can they find you? Mm, so, I mean, you guys can, you know, check out Twitter, Justin underscore Saliba or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I try not to be too active on, on, on social or anything like that, but, but uh, you know, if, if anybody has any questions or, or wants to get at me, just, you know, DM me there. I'm happy to, happy to chat poker with, with whoever, so. Um, and poker coaching, right? You can, you've got your fingerprints on the, on all the poker coaching stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to contact me there, but you, you know, you can also email there and, uh, I, I'm happy to chat with you on the discord. Discord is actually probably the best. Poker there coaching Discord's a, a good place for it. All right, man. It's been great having you. Best cool. of luck. Congratulations on Thanks, your bracelet. And, um, I'm sure there's going to be many more heartbreaks and feelings of euphoria to come. So happy Thanks. to be along this journey with you. Thanks so much, dude. I, re- I really appreciate you having me on. It's uh, you know, always fun chatting with you and, uh, and getting to learn from, from a lot of your insights. So thank, thanks so much, man. My pleasure, man. Have a great rest of your day. You too. You too. See you, man. Bye. See you. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.